Hello, my name is Pat Patton, and thank you for joining us today. Have you ever read something and wondered, how did the writer come up with such a terrific idea? Or maybe you thought to yourself, I wish I could write, but I don't have a clue how to begin. Our goal with this program is to explore the deep waters of creativity and to expose the answers to those elusive questions. To do that, we've interviewed some of the most exciting writers in America today, and we hope what they have to share about their writing process will inspire you to put your ideas in writing. Today our guest is Dr. Tanya Matthews. She is a biomedical engineer, and she is also a poet and spoken artist, performance artist, also known as Jaw Hipster. And here is her book, Still Swingin'. Tanya, thank you so much for being with us today. <laughs> thank you for having me. Well, we know that we're going to see you perform a little bit later in yes. the show. Mm -hmm. Now, you must tell everybody about the sort of mixture of you because you're like two different people. You know, yeah, two different people, uh, two different halves of my brain, I think, <laughs> going there. Um, but it's interesting that the persona of Jai Hipster wasn't really created, you know, because I had sort of a left side doing the poetry and a right side doing the math. It was more of Jai Hipster was a freeing experience when I started. There were, you know, personality traits or maybe costume choices <laughs> that I wanted to have on stage that I just didn't feel like a proper young, you know, Dr. Tanya Matthew should be wearing stilettos. So <laughs> I, uh, I sort of created this persona of Ja Hipster. Um, but over the years, um, there's become a lot of synergy. And I really just realized that it was just really another part of me that was always there, always meant to really just be part of the whole Dr. Matthews thing. But it's just not really kind of the way we're trained. We're always not raised to be full people sometimes. And so one part of me was really nurtured in one side of my life and another part was really nurtured in another side. But as I began to explore both of them, I could see how they would come together. Now, as a child, I know you were a straight-A student. <laughs> and, um, except were, for gym class. Except for, okay. <laughs> but you were probably, were you under pressure to perform as a student? And did you start writing as a sort of release? Um, no, my mother is an educator, um, and I was amazed. Um, I'm the oldest of four. We all have really, really different interests and really different aptitudes for school. And it was amazing that it was an environment that prioritized education, but not in a kind of way that made arbitrary standards mm. for each child. It was really sort of what you were good at. Um, but I actually really thrived in school. I, I really liked learning new things and exploring new ideas. And, and I realized really quickly that every time we got to something I didn't like, it's only going to last like two or three weeks. And then we move on to the next <laughs> <laughs> subject. Um, so I, I started writing. You know, I don't really know why. I think all kids naturally gravitate towards poetry writing. It's very easy. It's, you know, from everything from teaching us how to spell in the beginning when they do all the rhyming. And then it's a real easy introduction in grade school when they want you to write. So I was exposed to it in that way. I remember the whole roses are red, violets are blue, I'm mommy's own, only child, and you love me too. You know, the really cute stuff you do when you're like five. Um, and but didn't really, really start, I think, moving into the craft of poetry writing until college, even though I'd written some before then, um, but college and definitely um, for graduate school when I moved to Baltimore. Well, when did Jaw Hipster emerge? Baltimore. So we're going to thank uh, Baltimore, Maryland <laughs> for the Baltimore. emergence of, of Jaw Hipster. I um, had asked a friend of a friend where people went out and did poetry readings and performing and things like that. And um, they sent me over uh, to Calvert Street um, where they were having some open mics sort of downtown. And I went there the first time and I had my my paper and I kind of read and it was exciting and I sat down and then like the next person got up and it was all memorized and they had like a name and I was like oh is this how this works <laughs> so you know I went home and I, I got it together and the next week we came back the poem was memorized um, I was beginning to pick sort of like a name um, because the Baltimore poetry community is very tied to all of the performance arts, so the singers, um, the rappers, the musicians, they all come together in one spot. 
So that kind of environment is what is really good if you're on the performance poetry track. And so that's kind of how all that got created. Well, it's interesting because your, your outfit today or your costume, <laughs> whatever, I mean, it starts at the Afro, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And works down. So in your, in your doctor life mm -hmm. um, or your scientist life, I should say, it's a whole different look for you, isn't it? Um, there are definitely different aspects um, to the look, although I have to say that one of the things about being Jai Hipster is it's given me sort of more confidence or more practice at confidence in just being um, an African-American woman. So where the hair, the natural hair, is still a very political statement you know, oh. these days. Um, okay. And so, you know, it starts out on stage where I simply get a lot of love for looking this way. And so when I'm wearing it into other environments, I can take that love with me if there's some sort of resistance to the fact that I want to wear an Afrocentric skirt or if I want, you know, my hair in what is now considered non-traditional sort of business hair attire. So that's what I really kind of meant about the two feeding into the other. I think um, being on stage in that environment where there's a lot of love and a lot of acceptance gives me sort of the tools that I need to be um, authentic um, in the, quote, real world. So where does the material come from that you write about? Right now, I do um, a lot of observational and political commentary. Um, so of course, you know, be careful what you say to a poet. Um, it very well may end up in a poem. I have a lot of first lines that come from things people have said to me sort of offhandedly. Thank you very much. Um, CNN, the news, um, listening um, to songs on the radio that I think could have been written better. Um, all of those kinds of things. So right now I'm very much um, sort of like a tunnel. Things come in and then they come out um, as sort of commentary. So it's more satire. Um, sometimes it's satire, but no, it's much more of just a realistic sort of alternative viewpoint, I think mm. is probably a better way. Sort of, you know, the information that I'm getting filtered through sort of African-American or female or young or even a scientist eyes sometimes. It's interesting you talk about the African-American approach, but mm -hmm. I saw you perform mm -hmm. and, um, you know... I'm not African American, mm -hmm. but my goodness, I just fell in love with this character. I thought it was hysterical. I was laughing till I cried. <laughs> it was wonderful. And I think it's the kind of mm -hmm. I think it's the kind of humor that anyone can relate to. It's not, you know, I don't think you're just targeting the African American community. It, it seemed to me that yours was more of a, a broad um, multi uh, boundary approach. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I think that you hit on the very important point, Pat, that um, this is decidedly an African-American poet from an African-American perspective. But the idea that particular perspectives are exclusive to that group is really just wrong. Exactly. So you're really communicating across all boundaries is what you're really doing. Uh, if anyone's willing to listen, I'm willing to talk to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Now, you also have two CDs out. I do. I do. I get... Um, sort of a lot of requests uh, for sort of audio versions of what I'm doing. Because, you know, I'm a performance poet. Right. Um, and so a lot of times people like to hear the voice. Now, these CDs, where, where can people pick these up? The easiest way is uh, to meet me at the trunk of my car <laughs> or um, on my website, on which website. is uh, www.jahipster.com. Com. Okay, and the book is available where? The book is available um, everywhere. My favorite places are probably uh, Caribou Books for all of the Marylanders. They now have uh, five or six locations, um, and you can take the title and my name to any of your other favorite bookstores, and they'll be able to pull it up. So Barnes & Noble, Barnes & Noble, uh, your favorite independent bookstore, exactly. Oh, that's wonderful. And any more information about you, they can find at jawhipster, yes. at jawhipster.com. Mm -hmm. All right, good. Now, we have a huge treat in store for you because Jaw Hipster is going to perform for us today before the break. So, here we go. They are killing our babies and they're taking our drum. Grandma, 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 get your gun. Grandma, get your gun. The wolves are in the yard. They have come for the children. You ain't really got to shoot at nobody. Just aim for the moon. Graze Alpha Centauri's shoulder. Let stardust rain down. Knock the devil on his 
you know. Make sure he don't come around here no more. Grandma, get your gun. The wolves are in the yard. It's feeding time. Don't you know that destiny is a delicacy? Promise is quite tasty, and legacy will stick sweet to your ribs like family reunion barbecue. The revolution may be a bit lumpy, but it goes down smooth like your mashed potatoes. Grandma, get your gun. It used to be safe out here in the country. Young kings and queens could skip through the field sniffing daffodils, but now all the daffodils have been replaced by snapdragons, breathing down their necks the fires of this hellish existence, burning away all memories of how to be royalty. At every corner, a new definition of Venus, fly trapping the children's souls, swallowing their consciousness whole, teaching them that the natural state of our spirit is not beautiful. New age roosters have turned my babies into forgetful farm fowl. Now the coops are filled to overflow with eagles, thinking that the life of a chicken is acceptable, thinking that flying is overrated. Grandma, get your gun. The foxes are bold and the weasels got fearless. They will jump un up over and around your fence in broad daylight to snatch the eggs. Someone even taught the jackal how to play the drum. Now he's tap, 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 tapping to the beat. The jackal then mastered the boom bath and watched the babies form a line behind him, shaking their groove thing. He will dance them right out of the village. Grandma, the piper's price is too high. We may have to shoot him. Now I know we hid the guns to shield the babies from the violence, but now the sisters are being pimped by fashion and prostituted by billboards. I know we hid the guns to shield the babies from the violence, but now the brothers don't know how to defend themselves, swap in chains for puppet strings, watch them knock each other out. Grandma, get your gun. Get the buckshot, get the hollow point bullets. Grandma, break out the camouflage. It is time to stop playing because life was never a game. Our freedom never will be and our survival never is. Grandma, get your gun. The wolves are in the yard. Grandma, get your gun. The wolves are in the yard. Grandma, grandma, get your gun and give it to me. Thank you. These hips are wide as hell. Heaving and curving and bursting with the tales they tell, wide enough to balance square shoulders and heavy chest into characteristically plump hourglass figures. Wide enough to stop crack games on shady ghetto corners. Wide enough to birth fat black baby boys. These hips are wide as hell, heaving and stretching and yearning, masses of cocoa-touched, mocha-tinted, caramel-loved flesh, working far into the midnight hour. Wide enough, oh baby, baby, to accentuate those curvaceous backsides, give rise to those outlandish hip-hop hits. Wide enough to cradle you, baby love, after hours on a job that devalues your skin, chastises your mind, and scars your soul. Wide enough for these labor of love cornrows for you, baby girl. These hips are wide as hell, leaning and locking and swiveling, helping my mouth to articulate what words simply cannot handle. Wide enough to manipulate my walk into a graceful or attitudinal, but always incomparable sway that defines who I am today. Wide enough to remind you of the era of your ways, my man. Remind you, you always needed a woman you could hold on to. Wide enough to cradle you, grandbaby, if your mama cries on my shoulder, because this time, daddy may be gone for good. These hips, these hips, they are for me, they are for me, they are for me, they are for you, they are for you, they are for definition, for comfort, for sex appeal, for mothers, for motherhood, for play, for war, for weekends, for every day, for tight dresses, for A-line skirts, for war, for worship, for me, for you, for real. These hips, yes, our hips are just wide as hell. Thank you for watching Ideas in Writing. We hope you've enjoyed the program. If you're interested in finding out more about how to put your ideas in writing, go to our website at www.ideasinwriting.org. Or if you're an author or someone who works in the publishing industry and you would like to be interviewed on our show, you can contact me at patpatton at ideasinwriting.org. That's P-A-T-P-A-T-T-E-N at ideasinwriting.org. Thank you.